Hello everyone, I am Sudhir Dahal, Molecular Spectroscopy Product Manager at Simaju Scientific Instruments USA. I'll be your moderator today as we talk about UV visible near infrared spectroscopy for solid sample analysis and its importance in the field of material characterization. Before we get started, just a couple of notes for everyone viewing. There are a few items in the webinar console. Each of them, um, each of the items on the screen can be expanded by clicking and dragging from the bottom right of each window. If you accidentally close a screen and wonder where it went, like me, there's a widget bar at the bottom of the console that will open any windows that was closed accidentally. In that widget, from left to right, quickly, um, we have the yellow question mark for help uh, if you encounter any technical difficulties. The next blue projector screen is the presentation window. The red film strip next to it is the media player. Then we have the Q&A question box for you to submit any questions during the presentation. And um, we'll answer your questions uh, during the presentation as well as at the end of the session today. The next blue box with the portrait icon is the speaker's bio if you want to know more about us. Next, the green paper is our resources list. In here, you'll find links to Simazu Scientific Instruments website link to some frequently asked questions in this topic and some application notes on the topic. Feel free to download the documents anytime throughout the presentation. Finally, to its right is the icon for survey questions that you may fill out during or after the presentation. Okay, let's get started. Again, if you are uh, just joining us, I'm Sudhir, your moderator. Today we are going to be talking about UV visible near infrared spectroscopy for solid sample analysis and its importance in the field of material characterization. Today's presentation is divided into two parts. Feel free to send your questions using the question wizard anytime during the presentation and we'll answer them between the two parts and at the end of the presentation. We'll be starting off with a presentation from Dr. Jeffrey Taylor, who has over 35 years of experience in this field and has kindly agreed to help Simazu Molecular Spectroscopy Group to create technical notes and papers. In the last few months we've known him, he has enlightened us with enormous amount of knowledge and charmed us with his dynamic presentation skills. I'm sure you'll feel the same way by the end of this presentation. All right, uh, without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Taylor. Thank you for that introduction and welcome to Shimadzu's webcast on UV visible near infrared spectroscopy that addresses the materials characterization market. This webcast will consist of two parts. The first part will deal with looking at instrumental features or parameters that are necessary to participate in the measurements necessary for the materials characterization market, which requires a high performance spectrophotometer. The second part will deal with the accessories that are needed to measure the variety of samples that present themselves. This includes scatter transmission measurements, specular, diffuse, and total reflectance measurements as well. So what features define a high performance instrument for the materials characterization market? First, usable fast scan speeds. Most of these applications are quality control where sample throughput is an issue. Second, resolution. Many of these samples are solid and have narrow band uh, peaks that need to be resolved. Third, the ability to measure high absorbance or low percent T. We're usually talking about here measuring above six absorbance units, and this relies on very low stray light in the instruments and low noise levels. Fourth, true double beam capability so that you can reference beam attenuate. And fifth, maybe a double grading monochromator design. Double gradings are not always required, as we'll see. Let's take a quick look at spectral resolution and how it's defined for a spectrophotometer. On the left, you see a typical Gaussian peak, and resolution is defined as the full width at half maximum, or the half bandwidth. 
And this is determined by basically measuring to the top of the peak, there labeled F max, and going halfway down. And that width across the peak at half the peak height is considered the half bandwidth. Now, on the right is a gas phase spectra, which has a number of sharp peaks. So you can see how resolution can be important if you have narrow bands that you need to resolve. On this slide, we see a solution of benzene in ethanol. And it has some interesting peak structure to it. The half bandwidth of these peaks is roughly five nanometers. So there's a series of spectra here using different slit widths. You can see at a five nanometer slit width, we have resolved the peaks, but not to baseline resolution. So just setting the slit at the half bandwidth is not going to fully resolve all the peaks. You see as we go to two and do a one nanometer slit setting, the peaks sharpen up. The general rule of thumb is for full resolution, the slit should be between five to 10 times less than the full width at half maximum. The other thing that happens as you go to a small slit, and usually a slit of 0.1 nanometers is enough to resolve just about anything in solution or as a solid. Below 0.1, you're talking about gas phase resolution. But the other important factor here is that as we narrow the slit, we decrease the energy on the sample. And that means more noise. So there is a law of diminishing returns here. As we go to smaller slits, we're going to see an increase in noise. So at some point, there is a limit to the usable slit, the usable slit on the instrument. In most modern day instruments, you don't enter the scan speed directly. It is usually derived from the slit width, the data interval, and the integration time. Many of our competitors allow you to enter all three of these, which leads to a lot of trial and error and noisy spectra. Shimadzu had a better plan. First, you would select the slit width. From that, you would then agree on a data interval. That data interval is usually less than the slit, slit width, and usually you need five to 10 data points to define a peak. After that, you would select one of four scan speeds, fast, medium, slow, or very slow. After that, the software will then calculate an appropriate integration time and display the total scan time. Now, I realize the selection of four scan speeds labeled fast, medium, slow, and very slow seems a bit rinky-dink at this point, but bear with us and you'll see how this goes to the user's advantage. Now, the main driving parameter in scan speed is typically the data interval. The data interval is how often you're going to collect a data point for your spectra. Your data interval is usually driven from your resolution. You see here a spectrum with some very narrowly resolved peaks, and you see the vertical lines that show where a data point is collected. So resolution is the primary driving factor, but then that controls the data interval, which is the more important factor for scan speed. On the right in this slide, you see the menus that you would use to select the slit width and the data interval. So this shows you where you stand once you have selected your data interval. So you remember a couple of slides ago when I mentioned those four rinky-dink scan speeds? Here is the payoff slide for Shimadzu's scan speed calculation. You'll see in this chart that the descriptors for the scan speeds of high, medium, slow, and ultra low are paired with their data interval. And you see there is a quartet of scan speeds for every data interval. Towards the right, you will see the scan speed in nanometers per minute, as well as the dwell time or the integration time that it's going to spend at each data point. You can see here, 
that we have over 30 different scan speeds, more than enough to accommodate any sample in the materials characterization market. What Shimazu has done is take away all of the meaningless combinations that give a lot of noise. So with a Shimazu instrument, you don't have to fumble around trying different combinations of integration times and data interval. Once you select any one of these 30 plus combinations, you are almost guaranteed a relatively noise-free good spectrum. Now, when you ask most people about what makes a high performance UV visible near infrared spectrophotometer, what usually comes to mind is a large instrument that's heavy and expensive. Shimazu is out to prove that wrong. Here you see at the top very simple optical diagrams of a single versus a double grading instrument. On the bottom left, you see Shimazu's novel design that it uses in the UV2600, which is the single grading instrument, or the UV2700, which is the double grading instrument. But notice the folded over design. This makes it not only small, it makes the optical path short and the number of mirror bounces less. All that increases the energy of the instrument and improves the noise level. On the bottom right, you see the instrument sh shown against a monitor and a keyboard. This instrument is incredibly small by standards. So when your son or daughter has that science fair project at their school, you can just tuck this instrument under your arm and walk out the door with it to school. So on the previous slide, I was talking about single versus double grading instruments. And this brings us to talking about the stray light specification. Stray light is defined as any light in the instrument, not at the wavelength that the monochromator is set at. This means that stray light can be light leaks within the instrument, reflections off of various things, but most modern day instruments don't have problems like that. The main source of stray light are imperfections in the diffraction gratings. So almost all instruments these days use diffraction gratings and small imperfections in the lines of those gratings lead to scattered stray light. So stray light sets the upper limit of how high an absorbance you can measure. You see on the right here a little chart of transmission versus absorbance. Stray light is always given in percent T, and you can see how the logarithmic relationship leads to the stray light versus percent transmission that we're going to talk about in the next slide. I mentioned that stray light sets the upper absorbance level that an instrument can read. It sets the theoretical upper level, and as such, it's a nice benchmark to compare different instruments again. At the top here, you see a chart of the absorbance with no stray light on the x-axis and the absorbance with stray light on the y-axis. You'll notice that the black dotted line is the theoretical line of an instrument with no stray light. The red line is 0.001% T stray light, and you can see how stray light affects the functionality of an instrument. When the stray light value approaches the level of transmittance that the instrument is measuring, you see you start to deviate. Stray light always leads to a lower absorbance value than what's expected. And you see in the theoretical here, you eventually plateau out to a flat line when you reach the stray light level. The graph on the bottom shows the percent error associated with that. You can see there's very little error here associated until you get to about 3.5. And then the, the stray light causes a slowly increasing error as you go to higher absorbance values. So in this slide, we see stray light performance compared with real instruments. Now, the specifications we're using here are the guaranteed specifications from 
the instrumental brochures, not typical specs or anything like that. We're comparing guaranteed specs from the various instrument companies. You can see that the Shimazu UV2700 is the black line and has phenomenal stray light performance. This is a combination of the fact that it's a double grading instrument, but those gradings are proprietary gradings to Shimatsu that have been designed for very, very low straight light, stray light levels, the best for any grading in the industry. The red and the dotted green line are the competition. You can see they're an order of magnitude less than the UV2700 when comparing their guaranteed specs. So, along with stray light, noise is also another factor in determining how high an absorbance value an instrument can measure. Now, it's important to remember that all spectrophotometers directly measure percent T. They do not directly measure absorbance. They measure percent T and then convert that to absorbance through the Beer's Law calculation. Here we see a blocking filter, a spectrum of a blocking filter that's seven absorbance plus. And you're looking at it in percent T and you see that when you get to a high enough level of absorbance that the random noise level of an instrument then gives you a negative percent T. You can't take the log of a negative number so what instrument manufacturers do is for any negative percent T number, they substitute a very high absorbance value, something along the lines of 10 absorbance units uh, for anything that is negative in percent T. In this slide, you're looking at examples of what happens when your sample challenges not only the stray light, but also the noise limitation of the instrument you can see the overranging that happens when you get those negative percent transmission values that get values substituted for them. At the top are spectra from a competitor's double grading instrument without reference beam attenuation. You can see that there's noise that's starting at about 4.4 and the overranging starts at about 4.7. And this is typical for the industry. On the bottom, you see spectra from a, a Shimazu UV2600 single grading instrument, no reference beam attenuation. And here's where superior gradings and noise really make a difference. You can see that you have spectra up to 6.1 with noise and overranging starts at seven. So now I know there's somewhere out, someone out there going, but, but wait. The 2600 has exceeded the, the theoretical stray light maximum of the instrument, and you're absolutely right. This shows you how one of the ways in which you can beat the stray light specification where the sample becomes its own stray light filter. In other words, the sample absorbs the stray light and doesn't let it get to the detector. The only problem with this is it's very, it's very unpredictable how high you can read because your ability to, to have a sample acting as its own stray light filter literally depends on the absorption characteristics of the sample itself. So after having discussed in the previous slide how a sample can become its own stray light filter, we can now look at how some people get some extraordinarily high absorbance values by selecting the right sample to measure. Here you see samples that are basically neutral density filters that absorb evenly across the whole wavelength region, thereby absorbing all the stray light that can, absorb at, can occur at any of those wavelengths. So running neutral density light -like filters to prove high absorbance capability is a bit of a cheat. The data is real, but unless your sample is a neutral density filter, you're not going to see that on real world samples. So here is how Shimazu demonstrates high absorbance capability. We use a potassium permanganate solution, which is certainly not a neutral density filter. As a matter of fact, it has some very nice vibronic peak structure associated with it, and we're scanning the complete spectra. So this would be indicative of a real world sample trying to measure a high absorbance value. 
This was done on a UV2700 double grading instrument. And you can see that not only can we get data up above eight absorbance units, but you can also compare and contrast how the uh, various peak structures there overlay to make sure you're not getting any distortion due to your high absorbance measurement. You can see on the right, this is a uh, showing how the concentration corresponds to absorbance, and you can see that we are limit we are uh, linear through eight absorbance units on a real world sample. Now, in a previous slide, I mentioned how a high performance instrument has is double beam has a reference and a sample beam. So I thought I'd show an example of reference beam attenuation. This is where you block the reference beam with a screen, and it's used when you're measuring high absorbance values. Here, this is a single grading UV2600 instrument measuring a grayscale filter that has an absorbance of around five absorbance units. You can see there's the noise level in both spectra are phenomenal. But what you see here is the red spectrum is done with a 2.5 reference attenuation screen. You see we can scan at 600 nanometers a minute. The black is with no reference attenuation, and we had to slow down to 107 nanometers per minute. And you can see how the reference beam attenuated spectra has less noise, faster scan speeds, so it's a very desirable procedure if you want to speed up your high absorbance measurements. This brings us to the end of part one. So at this point, I'll pass control over to Sadir for our first question and answer session. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for the first part of the presentation. Before we move on to the second part, let's look at a couple of questions from the audience and answer them. Any remaining questions will be answered at the end of the presentation or via email, depending upon the available time. Well, um, here's the first question. Um, let me see. Why can't the UV2600 integrating sphere go beyond 1400 nanometers? That's an excellent question, actually. And all instruments are a compilation of their components. The diffraction grading that's in the instrument is typically blazed for a certain wavelength area where it provides the most energy. So the limiting factor in the, 26, the UV2600 is the diffraction grading in going above 1400. It's not a matter of the in-gas detector, but it's more a matter of the limited energy coming off the diffraction grading above 1400 that limits it. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, let's do one more question um, before we move on to the second part. Um, what is the reason for stray light in diffraction gratings and why are Shimazu's UV2700 gratings so good? Another good question that part of the answer is unfortunately proprietary, but stray light comes from gratings due to imperfections in how they're manufactured. In the good old days, they used to rule the gratings with a diamond scribe and literally etch the lines. And you can see how that would cause imperfections that reflect the light rather than diffract it, and that's what what's leads to stray light. Modern day gratings are produced photographically with a hologram pattern and then a photolithographic process where the image of the lines is literally photographed onto the grating and then etched away. One would assume that Shimatsu's proprietary gratings have a better photolithographic process that causes fewer artifacts in the gratings that lead to stray light. Go. Thank you. Um, all right, um, let's go to the second part of the presentation. Welcome to the second part of our webcast, where we're going to talk about applications and accessories. And to start off with, I'd like to draw your attention to the UV2600, which is a unique instrument that has an integrating sphere capable of going up to 1400 nanometers. So this UV visible instrument is capable of going a significant distance into the near infrared. On the right, you see a spectrum of water. 
in the near infrared water or the OH functional group can pose a number of interferences, but you see there's a nice clean region between 900 nanometers all the way up to 1400 nanometers. So this particular region is very important to the telecommunications industry, to the optics and coatings industry, and as we're about to see, to the nanomaterials industry. Carbon nanotubes are just one of many types of nanomaterials that have absorbance peaks in the near infrared region. Here you see a typical spectra of a carbon nanotube, and you can see that it has absorbance in the visible, which is the metallic part of the carbon nanotube, and it has two semiconductor regions, one that's primarily in the visible, the second is squarely in the near infrared range going up to 1400 nanometers. Now, nanotubes are almost always produced as mixtures. The near infrared spectroscopy can be used for both compositional analysis and also for purity analysis. You see the peaks are rather sharp and there are many of them and the fingerprint of these peaks can be used for composition analysis. Carbon nanotube purity analysis is another application where this near infrared region is very useful. Normally, when this mixture of nanotubes is prepared, it gets uh, separated by ultracentrifugation, and they have to identify the regions that have defect-free carbon nanotubes, which is here represented by the black spectrum. You can see the peaks that are nicely shaped. The defective carbon nanotubes are the red spectrum. You can see a distinct difference between that and the defect-free. The green spectrum is general grunge that's there as a result of the reaction. So you can see how this near infrared region is very useful for this type of analysis and shows how the UV2600 is a very inexpensive alternative with this integrating sphere to be able to make these near infrared measurements in an inexpensive manner without buying a full UV visible near infrared instrument that goes up to 3300 nanometers. So let's talk a little bit about light transmission through a solid sample. All sorts of interesting things can happen when you put a solid sample into a spectrophotometer. As you can see here, if light is good, you have linearly transmitted light, which is the blue line. Incident light is striking from the right side. And if your sample is transparent and clear, you get linearly transmitted light, which is shown by the blue glass filter at the bottom. If you're not so fortunate and you have scatter, scattering occurring, you get diffuse transmitted light that's coming off at all angles, and that's indicated by the opal glass. And that presents a real problem with artifacts in your measurement. But that's not all. You can also have other things associated with the sample, such as if the sides aren't parallel, if you have a rough surface, if you have internal cloudiness, if you have internal distortions, or if your sample is just long and reflects the light, this causes all sorts of artifacts of the beam coming through and striking the detector, which we're going to address in the next slide. On this slide, we see where a device called an integrating sphere comes to our rescue. An integrating sphere is nothing more than a hollow ball coated with a white reflective material with, a, with holes in it that the light goes in, bounces around, and eventually strikes the detector. So on the left, you see a typical instrument where you do a background correction, and the light strikes a certain place with a certain shape on the detector. Unfortunately, when you put a solid sample in that has all of the problems that we mentioned in the previous slide, you see that the light can move on the detector, and you get artifacts because your background correction is not appropriate for the sample you put in. Here's where the integrating sphere comes in. You see on the right where the light enters the integrating sphere for your background correction. Now you put your sample in, and as long as your light gets through the hole in the integrating sphere, no matter what your sample does, 
this light will now bounce around inside the integrating sphere and eventually strike the detector. And in this case, you will now get an artifact, an artifact free reading. So now we'll move on to reflection. Here you see light being reflected, the instant light coming in from the right, striking the sample at a certain angle theta. If the sample is smooth and shiny like the surface of a mirror, you'll get predominantly specularly reflected light where the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. If the surface is rough or textured like clothing or the walls or anything like that, you will get what's called diffuse reflected light, which is light that comes off at any number of angles through the whole 180 degree hemisphere. These two combined together either, either equal the total reflected light, which is both the specular and diffuse. Now, the other thing to remember here is that the sample can be transmitting light as well as reflecting light. So we've artificially separated transmittance from reflectance, but in many cases, the sample is doing both. And depending on the type of measurement you want to make, you will need to select the proper accessory for that. You measure specularly reflected light with a specular accessory and only a specular accessory. The specular reflectance accessory will only collect the specular light. If your sample has a diffuse component, the accessory will ignore it. If, it, if your sample transmits, the light will go through your sample and not be collected by the accessory. So this is an accessory to only measure specular reflectance. As you can see, the light is directed up to your sample. These accessories can be either fixed angle or they can be variable. The measurement is essentially you put a reference mirror on the surface to do the background correction and then you place your sample. Now bear in mind your background correction sets the instrument up to 100% and most reference mirrors are going to be aluminum and on the order of maybe 90% or so. So you've just lied to your instrument. The instrument has said your reference mirror is 100 when it's not. The way to correct this is to use a, re a calibrated reference mirror where the values are known. You can then place those values for the reference mirror into the software, and it will then normalize everything to give you an absolute reflectance. So now it's time to talk about integrating spheres and how they work. Integrating spheres are very useful accessories that can measure total reflectance, diffuse reflectance, and scatter transmission. They do not do a very good job of measuring specular. But because of their utility, they are one of the most commonly purchased accessories with any spectrophotometer because of the wide range of samples they allow you to measure. Here you see a typical integrating sphere, which again is a hollow ball coated with a white reflective coating. You can see the detectors are located in the bottom of the sphere. There's an entrance port for the sample and the reference beam and a place where the sample and reference beam strike. You can see the energy here of the beam coming in is designated by phi s and what reflects off the sample as rs. So in this slide, we show what happens on the first reflectance. We're assuming we have a diffuse sample at the sample port there on the right. The incident beam coming in and strikes it. And you see you get multiple reflections at all angles off of your sample, which are indicated by the blue lines going around inside the sphere. And the first reflection is the first strike inside the sphere for all of these. And each one of these results in multiple reflections. So you can see the fan of multiple reflections that come after it strikes first on the sphere. And without freaking out about the math that's on the bottom, you can see even for the first bounce, the math gets complicated. What I do want to draw your attention to is that the energy in the sphere is, is dependent on both the contribution of the sphere coating and it also has a contribution from the detectors and ports, which is anything in the sphere that is not coated white. So in this slide, we cut directly to the end game. 
here we're looking at n number of bounces inside the sphere. And the reason why we designate it n is because we don't know exactly how many bounces for any individual beam there are. Ideally, you would like between 15 to 30 bounces inside the sphere before the light strikes the detector. What you certainly don't want to happen is light to come directly off of your sample and strike a detector without bouncing around in the sphere. Hence the name integrating refers to this feature of light bouncing around. And as we'll see in a couple of future slides, the, the factors that determine sphere efficiency, such as size and port fraction, are all related to the number of bounces inside the sphere. One quick note, the reference beam and the sample beam do both go in the sphere, but they are never present at the same time. Spheres are used on chopped beam instrument, so only the reference or the sample beam is in the sphere at any one time. For a chopped beam instrument, this is 60 times a second, which is fast, but it's much slower than the speed of light. So again, only one beam is ever in the sphere at one time. So I mentioned in a previous slide that spheres have the ability to measure total reflection and diffuse reflection. Here you see on the left the diffuse component being measured. We're going to say we have a sample in there that now has both a diffuse and a specular component, something like maybe a piece of wood with a shiny varnish on it. You have diffuse from the wood and specular from the varnish. So on the left, you see the diffuse component being integrated by the sphere. On the right, you see that the specular component also comes off, strikes the sphere, and is integrated. This would be in the total reflection mode, you would integrate that specular component in with the diffuse. Depending on sphere design, there are ways of eliminating the specular to give diffuse only. And it basically, it traps out that specular light so it's not measured and you see only the diffuse on the left. So sooner or later, we had to come to a slide like this where we point out the three major influences on sphere, sphere function, the size, the port fraction, and the internal coating material. And you'll see the title of the slide is, we use, must consider data from a sphere to be approximate. And I think you'll see why when we go through this slide. Sphere size, the larger the sphere, the better the integration. However, the larger the sphere, the less energy you have, the more noise you have. So there's a trade-off between good integration and signal to noise. Port fraction is the area occupied by ports and detectors that is not reflective. For a 150 millimeter sphere, it's about 3%. For a 60 millimeter sphere, it's about 11%. The lower the port fraction, the better integration you're going to get. Lastly, and most importantly, Sphere internal coating reflectivity. This coating does not have to be 100% reflective. The internal coating reflectivity influences noise, not accuracy. So a coating reflectivity above 85% or greater, even as low as 80%, is considered acceptable. What does affect percent R accuracy is the reflectivity of the background correction target material you use to correct your background. And we'll be discussing that in a future slide. Let's drill down a little bit on the sphere inner wall material and compare the two main contenders here, barium sulfate and Spectralon. Spectralon is a patented product developed by Art Springsteen, at, formerly of LabSphere, who I've had the pleasure of working with for over 20 years. There are trade-offs to both. Spectralon didn't immediately make barium sulfate spheres irrelevant, so here is a comparison. First, Spectralon has a much higher cost to it. Also, barium sulfate has lower reflectance in the near-infrared region, whereas Spectralon has a very good, relatively high reflectivity through the near-infrared. Both spheres can generate absolute reflectance data with a calibrated plate. Uh, barium sulfate spheres, when they become uh, 
dirty can be recoded. You must literally remill or, or refurbish a, a, a spectralon sphere. Barium sulfate is relatively non-absorbent, whereas spectralon is fairly porous and readily absorbs volatiles and stain. A very humorous story that anyone that's worked with integrating sphere knows. Apparently, white reflective material attracts all sorts of insects, and it immediately screams, please go to the bathroom on me. So if you have an insect infestation in your lab, you will wind up with all sorts of fly specks inside your sphere. So one of the major sources of spheres getting dirty in some circumstances can be insect poop. So here is a direct comparison of the spectra of spectralon and barium sulfate. As you can see, spectralon is not perfect, but it really never dips below 95, 94%, whereas barium sulfate tends to carry water along with it. And you can see the three peaks there from water. And you can see that barium sulfate can get as low as maybe 75% or so out of 2,500. So a barium sulfate sphere will have more noise associated with it in that area between maybe 18, 1900 and 2500 nanometers. That doesn't mean that it's not usable there. You can usually adjust the instrument parameters to minimize the noise. So both spectralon and barium sulfate spheres are functional out to 2500 nanometers. So here's an important consideration. Using a spectralon plate to do your background correction makes almost all of the issues involved in using a barium sulfate sphere go away, with the exception of the noise between 2000 and 2500. Here you see two spectra of a reflective material for, through the full range of the sphere. If you, you can see if you use a barium sulfate target plate, now, both of these were run on a barium sulfate sphere, but if you use a barium sulfate target plate for the background correction, you can see you get artifacts. So my advice is don't use a barium sulfate plate, use spectralon. There's absolutely no reason why you can't use a spectralon plate on a barium sulfate sphere to generate your background correction, which will give you the blue line, which is free of artifacts. So here is the one circumstance where you would want to use possibly a barium sulfate target plate with a barium sulfate sphere, and it's with a scatter transmission measurement. You see on the left, during background correction, your beam strikes only the reference plate, whereas on the right, when you put a scatter transmission sample in, the beam is spread and it overfills the white reflectance plate to the side of the sphere. So here you would want that white reflectance plate to match the inside of the sphere. If it uses a spectralon plate, if it's a spectralon sphere, or a barium sulfate plate, if it's a barium sulfate sphere, you would not see any of the artifacts that we mentioned for reflectance measurements when using a barium sulfate plate on a barium sulfate sphere for scatter transmission measurement. So this slide shows one small issue with spectralon. I mentioned that most spectralon spheres are milled or carved. Spectralon has the hardness of ivory, so it can be cut, it can be milled, it can be, it can be shaped. So spectralon spheres are thicker, whereas the barium sulfate spheres have a coating that is flush with the sample. The, barium, uh, the spectralon sphere has a bit of a recess. Now, most spectralon spheres have the edges beveled to minimize this, but it can be an issue in trapping some of the diffuse reflectance that can get into the sphere. This also leads us into a discussion of certain sample properties that can cause artifacts. On the bottom left, you can see you never want your sample to be recessed if possible because you will trap reflected light from getting into the sphere and your measurement will be lower than what, you, what would be expected. The other instance is shown on the right where you have a transparent sample where the beam can penetrate into the sphere and then re-reflect re back internally from inside the sample and some of, those, some of those reflections do not make it into the sphere. So I mentioned previously that 
Integrating spheres have the ability to measure both total and diffuse only by trapping out the specular reflection. Shimazu does this in a rather interesting way. They literally can reverse the sample and reference beams to present two different geometries inside the sphere. At the top, you see a diffuse only configuration where the reference beam comes in the reference port, the sample comes in the sample port, and strikes the sample at zero degrees. Therefore, the specular travels back out the entrance port because uh, it comes in at zero, the specular goes out at zero. Therefore, at the top, you're measuring only diffuse. In the bottom, what is done as you flip a software control and it makes the reference beam the sample beam or the position of the reference beam the sample beam. So now the sample beam is coming in through what was the reflectance port, striking your sample at eight degrees. And that means the specular comes off at eight degrees and strikes the inside of the sphere. So this is a rather unique arrangement with Shimadzu spheres, has the, having the ability to swap the reference and the sample beam to change the configuration of the beams inside the port of the sphere. There is another additional advantage to the Shimadzu sphere geometry that we discussed in the previous slide, and that is depending on how you measure your sample, you can have the incident beam at either eight degrees or zero degrees. Now, most spheres by definition are eight degree hemispherical. However, there are people that would like to measure their sample at zero degrees angle of incidence, which on the Shimadzu sphere you can do. That would be the diffuse only mode because obviously the specular is going to go back out along the sample beam path. But this type of sphere design does give you the added advantage of being able to have an angle of incidence for your sphere at either eight or zero degrees. On our last two slides, we're going to deal with some sampling issues regarding integrating spheres. One is that rarely are your samples 100% diffuse or 100% specular. This means that some judgment is necessary in trying to figure out how to run your sample on a sphere because a lot of diffuse samples have a specular component to them. The picture at the top shows what the beam inside a sphere should, like with it, should look like with a diffuse sample. It should be evenly distributed and, and bright because the light's coming off your sample as only a diffuse reflection. If you have a specular component, and the specular component can be uh, of various intensity, on the bottom left, you see a 10% specular sample with the other 90% being diffuse. You can see you're starting to, to look at a hot spot inside the sphere. On the right, we go up to 90% and the hot spot is brighter. These hot spots present issues in generating artifacts. And the way to deal with these is if your, is if your sample is along 100% or, or nine, I'm sorry, around 90% or 80% specular, you might want a background correct with a mirror rather than a white spectralon plate. So you're duplicating the specular component of your sample. But this is an issue that requires some degree of flexibility and judgment in, in deciding when to go with a mirror as opposed to a white plate. Lastly, we'll consider samples that have a texture to them. They are diffuse, but there is a texture running along a certain orientation. This is very common in fabrics where the weave actually gives you a diffuse component that is structured. So you see four different positions to place a fabric up against the diffuse reflectance port of a sphere. And because of the weave and its orientation, these will generate different spectra, which you can see at the top, you get a very different spectra depending on the bright spots and the shadow parts in this weave and how they reflect light. The only real solution to something like this is to run four positions that's demonstrated here and then average them together. 
because there, there is, with some samples, a sample dependency that relates to its orientation, and the only way to deal with that would be to run multiple orientations in average. This brings us to the end of part two. So I'll now turn things over to Sadir again for our last question and answer session. Thank you very much for such an exciting presentation, Dr. Taylor. And thank you to our audience for attending and sending questions. We'll now answer your questions. Um, we've, in fact, received a lot of them. Uh, and we'll do our best to cover as much as we can in the next few minutes we have. Uh, the first question I see here is, um, are there any samples that cannot be measured with an integrating sphere? Well, there are, but it doesn't depend on the actual type of sample. An integrating sphere, if you can find a way of mounting the sample, you can run liquids uh, with a sphere, you can run creams, gels, and just about any type of solid that either reflects or transmits. However, if a sample fluoresces, that will cause a problem. And the reason is that the, the monochromator that selects the wavelength is prior to the integrating sphere. So you're relying on the sphere to be a rather dumb detector that simply measures the amount of monochromatic light that's being either reflected or transmitted. With a fluorescence sample, the, there's no way of separating out the fluorescence from light being transmitted, and the fluorescence is always going to be at a longer wavelength than the incident light. So you're going to pick up fluorescence inside the sphere now, some people have tried using filters in front of the sphere to do this, and that really doesn't work too well, nor would I recommend it. So you just have to be aware of your samples that might fluoresce and really not run them on a sphere. Thank you. Uh, the second question, uh, actually, I, I see two very similar questions, so I'll combine them. Um, what is so special about a 150 millimeter sphere that makes it a standard sphere for color work? And the other one was, why is the 150 millimeter sphere considered a standard sphere? Basically, the 150 millimeter sphere is considered standard because of consensus. There are, as I mentioned in my presentation, there are trade-offs with sphere size, port fraction, so different size spheres have different trade-offs. The 150 sphere does a fairly good job of shooting the middle. It has a small port fraction, it has excellent integration, but it also has less energy than a 60 millimeter sphere, so it would be slightly noisier. The answer to the last question is, a group of people got together and declared the 150 sphere to be the standard color sphere that would be used for comparison of data between instruments. This does not mean that you can't run excellent color data on a 60 millimeter sphere. There's nothing that precludes literally any integrating sphere from measuring color or diffuse reflectance. It's just that the various regulating bodies around the world a long time ago, back in the early days of integrating spheres decided that the 150 would be the standard sphere for inter-instrument comparison. Thank you. Um, There's uh, one more question. Um, why are spectralon spheres so expensive? That's an easy and a very short answer. Spectralon is a proprietary uh, material that was patented by a certain company and as long as they hold the patent, they get to regulate the price on anyone that they sell Spectralon to. Uh, just as in the drug industry, once your drug goes generic and the patent runs out, you get a whole bunch of people producing that drug at a much lower cost. So at some point, the patent will run out and Spectralon spheres will become much less expensive. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Uh, and thank you uh, to our audience for all the interesting questions. Unfortunately, we'll have to stop only in the interest of time. Um, we'll reach out individually to each of you whose questions we were not able to answer today. Once again, thank you all for attending and participating.
will send you an email with a link to view a recorded version of this entire presentation anytime. We hope to have you back in webinars we organize in the future. Have a great day. Thank you.